Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Aaron Poynton, and I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of A3 Global. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we had about 30 people register, but uh, many people could not make it in person because of time zone differences and other obligations. So uh, it was asked that we record this presentation and make it available to them later. So this is going to be recorded. Um, additionally, uh, we do have a plug-in for uh, closed caption. So if you go to the bottom and you click co closed caption, um, you will be able to see uh, what we're saying in, in text as well through the rev.com Zoom plugin. Um, so thank you. We're going to spend about 45 minutes or so this morning going through battery basics, uh, which will be led um, by uh, Dr. Jonathan Dewan up at Northeastern University. Uh, but before we do that, I would just like to introduce myself and A3 Global and uh, just explain a little bit about what we're doing with batteries. Um, so, Jonathan, if you have the presentation, we can get started. Um, all right. Um, yes, my uh, name is, again, Dr. Jonathan Duan, I'm Director of Product Management at A3 Global. And um, this battery basics webinar is based around how do batteries work and at a very um, high level, uh, different concepts of voltage, current, resistance, and um, C rate, amp hour capacity, et cetera. And we'll go briefly into nickel metal hydride and some lithium ion batteries. We actually have Ron Turi here who will be um, presenting a couple of slides on on lithium ions, he's our uh, lithium ion battery expert. So, but, um, okay, so Aaron, I'll, I'll push forward and you can- um, Yeah, before we get started, just a quick overview of A3 Global, if you can go to the next slide. So uh, A3 Global, and you've seen, you can see Jonathan on the bottom left. I'm on the bottom right. I come from a technology uh, background, but our CEO, Michael Cardone III, comes from a, a three-generation family business. He was- formerly the president uh, of Cardone Industries, which at one time was the, was the uh, largest uh, privately held remanufacturer uh, in the world with over 6,000 employees based out of Philadelphia area, but with global operations. And they focused on remanufacturing parts and components for ICE vehicles, which are your traditional combustion uh, vehicles. Uh, the family sold the company a few years ago, and Michael and I partnered together to form A3 Global, which is focused on the future of transportation as the industry starts to move away from ICE vehicles and more towards hybrid and electric vehicles. And we founded A3 Global to really focus on the aftermarket of those vehicles. Uh, and as you know, batteries are the new engines. Um, so we have a heavy focus on batteries. We acquired Nuvant Systems in January of this year. And Nuvant Systems uh, has technology which came from Northeastern University that was developed by our current SVP of Research and Development, Dr. Eugene Schmukin, who is a professor of chemistry at Northeastern. And we make the devices that are used for remanufacturing uh, batteries. Right now, we're currently focused on nickel metal batteries because most of the hybrid vehicles that are in today's aftermarket service cycle are uh, hybrid vehicles, and that predominant battery is the nickel metal. But we understand that the industry, especially with EVs, will be making a transition uh, towards lithium ion batteries with a variety of different chemistries. So we're currently working on ways to recondition and remanufacture lithium ion batteries. Uh, and we hope to have our first lithium ion battery uh, diagnosis and repair tool launched early uh, next year. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so today we're going to focus on the fourth bullet point, which is the, our hybrid electric transportation solutions focused on hybrid and EVs. 
but you could take a look there and see the number of other services that A3 provides uh, outside of that, which are mostly design consultation, sourcing, distribution, logistics, uh, anything related to vehicles, especially electric and hybrid vehicles. Next slide. Also, this is just a couple of fun pictures here of the Cardone family, which is uh, a little bit of our legacy because Michael Cardone III is our current CEO. Um, but this is where they got started in Philadelphia. Um, both Michael Cardone Sr. and Jr. were inducted into the Automotive Hall of Fame, and we're happy to continue the legacy of automotive aftermarket excellence uh, with the new generation of Michael Cardone III, who is uh, the, the CEO of A3 Global. Uh, and then uh, lastly, you know, we're going to talk today about electrification, but there's lots of other uh, automotive changes that are um, happening as we enter this vehicle revolution um, that have to do with connectivity, uh, autonomous vehicles, the shared economy. Um, we call this the CASE future. Um, but uh, clearly, I think um, the market is moving towards electrification, and that's where we want to focus um, today's conversation. And this is just a little bit of evidence on that. If you happen to watch uh, in the U in the U.S. last uh, February the Super Bowl, um, you can see that nearly every single commercial was focused on EVs, and many of the traditional automakers, uh, uh, such as Ford, um, are committing to move to EVs or more sustainable vehicles uh, in the future. And the hybrid electric sales grew seventy six percent in 2020 to 2021 for a record high and EV sales uh, grew to 83%. Uh, and then more than half of recipients in a recent poll are likely to buy EVs or HEVs in their next uh, vehicle. And it's estimated that within just a couple of short years that HEVs and EVs will account for 30% of all vehicle sales in the US. And it's noteworthy that many countries, especially in Europe and in Scandinavia, have already met or, or exceeded that number. Uh, so the U.S. is a little bit behind. But what all of this means for the automotive aftermarket is uh, that this is sort of an, an undeniable future, that this is the way that the industry is heading. And it presents a lot of opportunities um, for new business models, especially when it comes to um, manufacturing, repairing, diagnosing and uh, reconditioning uh, batteries to, to keep those batteries on the road longer and to provide alternative solutions to simply replacing a vehicle battery uh, after it's reached its initial life, uh, which in many cases we're seeing uh, the battery will, will die or become ineffective or degraded performance well before the vehicle is ready to leave the road especially since people are holding onto their vehicles longer. And in the United States, the average vehicle is on the road these days for over 12 years. So that's it. Just a quick highlight of who we are in A3 Global. And I know you guys joined to learn about batteries. So I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan. All right, great. Uh, we actually have one more kind of introductory slide about the electrification of vehicles and how in here you can see uh, we are getting prime for battery service once these um, hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles um, start to age. But let's uh, move forward. And um, the next slide, I have the outline of the rest of the presentation. So we will kind of start with understanding voltage, current, resistance. Um, these are all electrochemical parts of uh, terms uh, that are required when discussing batteries. We'll go over what cycling batteries uh, does, the charge, discharge, C rate, how each of these affect the capacity of the battery and affect the age of the battery. And we'll also discuss how to measure amp hour capacity and what our energy of the batteries, um, and then cover specifically the nickel metal hydride chemistry. And um, our guest Ron Turi will be discussing um, lithium ion batteries and their use in electric vehicles. Um, so we can also have any questions um, that you may have during the webinar, please either uh, unmute yourself and ask, or you can also type questions into the chat, okay, and we will um, cover those, and Mateo can, can kind of keep an eye on that and um, let 
us know if we have any any questions. All right. So how do batteries work? Um, here you can see a couple images of, of batteries. Everyone's pretty familiar with the typical alkaline C cell battery. Um, these batteries here are, are known as primary batteries, meaning that they are single use um, and cannot be recharged and uh, used again. Um, we have here the Toyota nickel motor hydride module, which um, you're probably familiar with. Uh, if you're attending this this webinar, um, that is a module that is found in the Toyota Prius, all of the different battery packs um, of hybrids. And over on the right, we have the lithium um, uh, lithium ions 18650 cells. Um, these are found in a number of electric vehicles and also found in um, older laptops, uh, other types of handheld devices use the lithium ion technology because it provides a lot of uh, energy density and power in a uh, smaller package. So batteries um, supply energy uh, by connecting a, a load to the positive and negative terminals. Okay, and this all centers around voltage, current, and resistance. Um, uh, the next slide we will explain a little bit um, of the terminology that we'll be using, um, but each of these terms I will further describe in other slides, but in general, we'll be looking at, at voltage. Uh, that is the difference in potential between the positive and negative battery terminals. So if you take a voltmeter and put it up to a battery, uh, you can read, read the voltage, okay? And that's between the positive and negative terminals of that battery. The current, uh, that describes how fast coulombs are transported point to point in a circuit. Okay, so uh, that is measured in amps. And so you will have um, discussions about how, how fast you charge or discharge a battery. And that, that is defined by the current um, or amps. Watts, that is a measure of power or work that is equal to one amp flowing across the potential of of one volt, and that is um, used in describing how much power a battery can give. Um, that's generally given in, in watts. And the resistance. So resistance in a battery, that is described as how much the conductor, which is the battery itself, opposes electrical current. So in a battery, you want your resistance to be pretty low um, because the higher the resistance, the more and energy loss, the less efficient the battery is. And capacity, um, that's given in amp hours and that's how much charge a battery can hold, okay? Um, so we have a couple equations here. So watts, uh, in order to get watts, um, that is your voltage times your current, given in uh, volts and amps. And your voltage, um, Ohm's law is, tells us that voltage is equal to current times resistance. And we'll explain a little uh, more about these, these formulas and concepts um, in the next couple of slides. And also note that uh, time, um, in this discussion, we'll, we'll discuss time um, with the units of, of hours, okay? So starting with uh, voltage, what is, that I, I like to um, kind of describe a battery as a container that kind of holds water, okay? So in this case, um, you can see this container here, all right, which has a certain um, size. It also has a spout that goes in and a spout that goes out, okay? The amount of water within the container, that is the charge, okay? So this, um, level of water, that's the, the charge or the amp hours that is contained in this container or battery. The voltage is the pressure or height of water, and that's kind of what can push the battery um, to, to give current, all right? And current is defined as the, the flow of water. So what happens when you open the spout, okay? And that's equivalent to connecting a load to the battery terminals, the positive and negative. Water will drain out, okay? So as more water is drained, 
the pressure right goes down and so if the water is drained and you see the water level go down uh, that is equivalent to the voltage going down as you discharge a battery the voltage will will decrease so in this case voltage it's the force that actually pushes the current when you're discharging So this is uh, the same analogy. However, let's take the first container and actually make the spout bigger. So what happens when you, when you do that? You'll actually get more current and more flow coming out, okay? So remember that current, you can, it's kind of analogous to the size of the spout or how much flow you will actually get. And what resistance is, in this analogy, resistance, uh, if you look over on the right, it's the opposition to flow. So if you actually have a, a more narrow spout, you get less flow um, of discharge coming out. So an, a narrow pipe actually resists the flow of water more than the wide pipe. So a circuit with higher resistance, a more narrow pipe will actually allow less charge to flow and you will get less less current out okay any um questions on these uh first three kind of terms in the analogy okay so i promised we'd go back and discuss what what ohm's law is so in this case remember that ohm's law is voltage is equal to your current times your resistance. Okay, so in uh, this analogy, we have that on the left, this container, one volt is equal to one amp times one ohm. Okay, over on the right, we actually have less, it's a bigger spout. Okay, so you have less resistance here. So using this equation, what uh, do you believe the current would be? And if you'd like to answer, you can unmute yourself or type it into the chat. Okay, so in this case, you would actually have that uh, current be two amps, okay? Um, and that is according to the equation. And that shows that the less resistance you have, the more current um, you will have based on the same voltage. Okay, so let's look, um, I'm gonna continue with this analogy and let's imagine now, we're gonna discuss charging and discharging. So imagine that you have two empty water tanks, which are basically jugs uh, that are the same, same height. Okay, they're a little wider. Um, jug A is a little wider and it can hold eight cups of water, all right? And jug B can only hold five cups of water. So if we fill both of these jugs each at one cup per hour, after three hours, we will have three cups of water in jug A and three cups of water in jug B. So you can actually see the voltage of, of jug B will be a little, a little higher depending on um, the height of the container. So if the container is more narrow, you will actually have a higher voltage for that specific battery. Okay, so this is kind of a, an example of, of charging. Um, and so analogous to a battery, if we have now battery A and battery B, again, it's gonna be actually eight amp hours instead of cups. And battery B is five amp hour. If we charge at one amp, after three hours, you will have battery A with three amp hours. So it's 38% full. And jug B will also be at three amp hours. But because it's a smaller, uh, less capacity battery, it will be 6% full. So a higher um, state of charge. Okay. Any questions on, on this? We're actually going to next look at what happens if you fill more quickly. In this case, we're looking at one amp. And in this next slide, we're actually charging now at, at 
two amps, okay? So if you're charging at two amps after three hours, so if you do two amps times three hours, that'll give you six amp hours. Battery A is 75% full, okay? It has the six amp hours in it. In battery B, you have five amp hours because that's the full capacity of the battery. You actually kind of overflow, we'll say, if you're, we're discussing in terms of water. So what actually happens to that extra, extra water, that extra charge? Does anyone have a guess on that? Okay, so in battery B, where does that extra charge go? It's actually um, going to be exhibited as either heat or any other type. That that charge will go somewhere, um, and so a bat that battery will either heat up or be very kind of inefficient and lose. Um, you lose that extra one amp hour. Okay, so in general, that that a lot of times um, shows itself as as heat and a battery heating up. Okay, so that is what um, charging a battery looks like. Let's, let's see what discharging a battery looks like also. So imagine we have the same jugs again, but we completely fill them and we're actually adding a, a little bigger spout now. So it's actually gonna be two cups per hour. After three hours, your jug A loses six cups. So it is now containing just two cups. And jug B, it's almost empty because we drained it all the way. However, if you notice where the placement of the spout is, you actually have about 0.25 cups left, okay? If we now look at this in terms of a battery, here we go. Um, so again, eight amp hours, five amp hours. You're left here with two amp hours. And in battery B, you're left with a quarter of an amp hour, okay? This explains why dead batteries actually have some voltage left because you are discharging down to a certain voltage. Um, and if you drain the battery completely, most batteries will have some charge left in it. That's why, especially with the uh, Toyota Prismatic modules, um, a battery that has, um, been drained completely, we'll still have, it should read about six, six and a half uh, volts um, compared to uh, other batteries, which could read zero. Also, each of these modules um, are very well made. I, I've seen the Honda modules that have six cells in it read much lower, but you will have some voltage left in a dead battery. Okay. So any questions on this, this slide? Okay, so what is uh, C rate? What is a uh, C rate, okay? So C rate is a measure of the rate at which a battery is discharged relative to a maximum capacity. What does that mean? It means that 1C, the rate of 1C will discharge a full battery in one hour. Okay, so in um, talking about the Toyota module, these are rated at 6.5 amp hours. So in this case, 1C is 6.5 amps, meaning that if you, Discharge at 6.5 amps, that module will be empty, will drain completely in one hour. All right. 10C in this case is 65 amps. So anything, and when we're referring to C, 1C is 6.5. Anything you do to C, you'll do to the current. Okay. So for the total module, um, this question is what is 0.5C? And this is kind of multiple choice. So if you would like to answer the question, uh, you can unmute yourself or type it into the chat.
So if we are, if we say it's 0.5 C, so that's half of a C, we're gonna do the same thing to the, the current. So in this case, 0.5 C is 3.25 amps, okay? An additional question, how long would it take for you to discharge the battery completely if you are discharging at 3.25 amps? That answer would be two hours, right? I cannot do this properly with mouse, but it would be two hours. All right. If you're discharging at 0.5 C, it will take two hours to fully discharge this battery. And over on the right here, you can actually see what happens if you charge too quickly and too high. So this is a total module. Um, the one on the left you can see is you know normal and uh, the proper size. And if you charge too fast, you actually build up um, gas inside the battery. And that is what causes, causes the swelling. Okay, so remember that um, C rate is the current that it takes to discharge a particular battery in one hour. So C rate isn't always 6.5 amps. It depends on the battery that you're discussing. So here we have three different batteries um, and the one on the left has eight amp hour capacity. The one on the in the middle is six amp hour and the one on the right has one amp hour capacity, all right? So in each of these cases, their one C, their C rate, it's different. So one C in this case is eight amps. In this case, it's six amps. In this case, it's one amp. So C rate allows you to discuss and compare different types of batteries to each other, all right? So let's see now what you would estimate the capacity to be of this battery if you discharge it, let's say at 10 C at 80 amps, okay? And note that when you discharge more quickly, you lose a lot of that excess energy as, as heat. Any guesses? Remember that if you are discharging at 1C, the answer is eight amp hours. However, at 10C, it's gonna be, again, less efficient. So instead of getting eight amp hours out of it, you might actually only get 7.5 amp hours, okay? So this kind of varies depending on the type of battery, the type of chemistry, um, but in general, the quicker you discharge, so the higher the current, it's gonna be less efficient and um, you're gonna get a lower rating on that battery. Okay, so any um, questions so far on these, these concepts? Before we move on specifically to the nickel metal hydride. Okay, so with the nickel metal hydride cells, um, you have a positive and negative electrode, right? So your negative electrode, this is the um, reaction that's occurring at the negative electrode. Um, the metal hydride um, then becomes the metal. Um, and when it, this is during the discharge actually. So during the discharge, this is the reaction that happens at the negative electrode for your metal hydride. And I'm not gonna go too deep into the chemistry, um, but know that the negative electrode is referred to as the metal hydride side. And on the positive electrode, that is where your um, nickel oxy, oxide hydroxide is, okay? So when you look at these cell voltages, these are, individual voltages that are found, um, the potentials of each of these reactions. So when you combine them, okay, you that's how we get that it, this cell is nominally 1.2 volts. You can see it's actually 1.35, um, but that's kind of a charged battery. So a fully charged 
cell will read 1.35 volts, but they refer to it nominally as 1.2. So in this case, if we look at the nickel metal hydride module, there are six cells in series. And when you place these cells in series, you actually combine the voltages. So in this case, they refer to this module as a 7.2 volt module. Um, and that's multiplying your nominal cell voltage by six, but fully charged, you should be reading about 8.1 volts, okay? So let's look at kind of the hierarchy of the, the cells to modules to packs. So if we're starting on the uh, left here, again, you have the cell. If you multiply it by six to get the module and put them all in series, that's where you're getting the 7.2 volts. In a Toyota Prius pack, you actually combine 28 of these modules. Okay, and they are all connected in series again. So that's how you end up with 202 volts, right? 7.2 times 28. When we're discussing these modules, each of them have a capacity of 6.5 amp hours. And because we're connecting all of these modules in series, um, your voltage gets multiplied by 28. However, your capacity stays the same. Okay, so the capacity actually, it says that the capacity of these modules is 6.5 amp hours the capacity of each cell is also 6.5 amp hours because remember that each cell is connected in series. Okay, so each of these cells are in series with each other for the module, but then they're also all in series within the pack. Okay. Any questions um, on, on how to go from cells to modules to packs? And in different vehicles, um, you're gonna have different numbers of, of cores and packs. And you also can have different numbers of cells within the modules. All right, so it, for example, a Ford Escape has five cells per module and something like a Toyota Highlander actually has eight cells per module. So it's either a little bigger, smaller, um, it can be cylindrical, which uh, looks like a, a rod, or prismatic, which looks like a square, okay? So what's the point of these um, nickel metal hydride packs? So they're used in hybrid vehicles, right? And, and the point of um, using them in hybrid vehicles is to assist your internal combustion engine. Like how hybrids work, they give you better fuel economy and features such as regenerative braking constantly charge and discharge the nickel metal hydride battery. So what happens is when you accelerate uh, your, your hybrid vehicle, the battery will be discharged a little bit. And then once it gets going, that's when your internal combustion kicks in. So it helps with that, um, kind of increase the efficiency by doing that. But then once your internal combustion engine is on the battery, um, is, is no longer powering the vehicle. And then when you brake, due to the regenerative braking, you charge that battery back up a little bit. So within a hybrid vehicle, you're constantly charging and discharging the battery a small amount up and down, okay? And so because the goal of hybrids is to just give you better fuel economy, um, better efficiency for the vehicle. It does not require the battery to provide all of the energy, okay? So you do not need high um, energy density in a hybrid vehicle type battery. That's why they're primarily, the nickel metal hydride batteries are primarily used in hybrid vehicles. When we start discussing electric vehicles um, in, in Ron's section coming up, you'll kind of see why we rely on lithium ion batteries 
for fully electric vehicles. And that's due to the fact that it has a much higher energy density and that stems a lot from the, the voltage. So again, nickel metal hydride cells have 1.2 volt um, potential, 1.2 volts. For lithium ion, it's much higher. And um, as kind of the last part of the nickel metal hydride section, I just wanted to give you here a list of, of the nickel metal hydride batteries. Um, this is not a complete list. We have um, additional vehicles that use nickel metal hydride batteries, but these are primarily the ones found in the, the US currently. Um, and um, additional vehicles in the Toyota lineup are still using nickel metal hydride batteries because again, it's for the assistance of the engine, the internal combustion engine. So it does not require high energy density, high power, but the fact that the capacity is pretty, is very high um, helps the, the, uh, the use of the battery within the vehicle, okay? All right, and with that, um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Ron for his um, little discussion and preview of, of lithium ion nickel metal hydride automotive batteries. Um, thanks, thanks, Ron, for, for joining us. And if you want to kind of take over. <laughs> Certainly. Thank you very much for having me on board and uh, participate in this. I I'm really excited about A3 Global because the company is focused on remanufacturing batteries. And the logical place to start is nickel metal hydride. Nickel metal hydride uh, was introduced early on because lithium ion honestly just wasn't ready for, for the market. And it's a beautiful fit for hybrid electric vehicles. As Jonathan was saying, a lot of these batteries are high power batteries and nickel metal hydride is made for that. And I'm gonna cover a little bit of that and a little bit about myself. I'm a chemical engineer and battery engineer today, uh, what I consider myself, and I've been in the industry of lithium-ion batteries since 1991 when Sony came out with some of the first 18650 cells. A lot of companies wanted to make the same thing. They came to the company I was working for, which was coating electrodes for a Polaroid, and next thing you know, we're coating lithium-ion electrodes. It was a, a really interesting time. I enjoyed it a lot. I joined a startup company. I was there for 12 years, a lithium technology corporation and uh, learned a lot about the basics of lithium ion battery uh, and how it can be designed. And it's evolved enormously since then, of course, but a lot of the, a lot of the fundamentals have remained the same, how they're coded, the way things are assembled, the kind of cells that you see can come in pouches, they can come in prismatic cans or cylindrical cases, uh, all depending on the preference on the end use application and the companies that are making them and uh, how, uh, how the economics all pan out. But one thing that's kind of interesting is that today you see a lot of EVs coming into the market. And 10 years ago, which is about the time you see some uh, EV battery modules coming out of service, going in uh, end of life for first service and being ready for some remanufacturing, those batteries are kind of different than what they are today. So there's still a moving target in terms of remanufacturing, but a very interesting one because it gives a lot of opportunities to take batteries from a decade ago and turn them into something that can be put back into that vehicle or perhaps repurposed for grid applications. There are a lot of possibilities. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about lithium ion batteries, LIB, uh, it's abbreviated here as the cell, uh, and uh, how the market is growing, how the cell manufacturing base is growing, touch upon this a little bit. And I'm also gonna talk about the, uh, uh, the opportunities for the supply chain, which also includes, what do you do with the end of life batteries? Uh, you know, a lot of people are concerned. What are you going to do? Are they going to stockpile these batteries? No, of course not. They are too valuable to just stockpile. These are batteries that can go back into uh, service when that's the best use uh, or into the original uh, EV would be the simplest and most straightforward. But going into grid battery application or going uh, into another kind of battery application extends the value and service of the materials that you put in and also extends the carbon footprint. So all of the uh, emissions that were invested in manufacturing that initial battery are spread out over a longer period of time. So remanufacturing is, I think, is, is a crucial part of uh, getting the, the uh, lowest impact on the environment and best value for everybody when it comes to remanufacturing batteries. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about 
uh, some of the regional opportunities that are evolving. Uh, you can see in uh, North America, there's quite a bit going on, especially with the, uh, with the recent uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act legislation, all the terms there, uh, really spurring growth of lithium ion battery manufacturing in North America in general, US, uh, but that also includes uh, the North American trade partners. And, uh, and of course, a lot's been going on in Europe as well. So it's really a global phenomenon that is making batteries uh, part and parcel of our, our energy system in general. And it makes total sense to do remanufacturing. That is, that is uh, an incredibly important part of this. If you could go to the next slide, please. The, um, you know, the, basically recapping a little bit more about what I will be talking about. And I do wanna hit the high level differences between lithium ion and nickel metal hydride because nickel metal hydride, that's what we're remanufacturing today. But in the future, we'll be remanufacturing lithium ion. So what are the differences here? Why were they chosen like this in the first place? And what can you do once you get this battery back? Also be talking a little bit about some of the EV battery construction that's been happening over the last decade and today. Uh, they're not those pretty little uh, Lego-like modules that you can pull apart uh, in nickel metal hydride batteries. You have to do a lot more work in order to actually access the components that you're gonna be testing and possibly replacing pieces here and there. So there's more to do on exactly how, uh, how, how to set up the future of remanufacturing these complex electric vehicle batteries. And Jonathan pointed out, they're not the same. They're, they're geared for high energy density because you want a lot of energy stored in a compact volume so that you can uh, get a lot of driving range. And that's not the same with hybrid electric vehicles where you're looking at power leveling. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, the end of life supply chain, um, the where these batteries are gonna come from, how long will it take, what are the volumes really, and uh, what do we do in the meantime? And uh, taking a look at the product technology in general, because as that's changing, that also changes the feed stream of end of life batteries as they come back, they're gonna look different. There are gonna be differences at the cell level, at the battery level, uh, and how they were made. Everything is gonna be, be different, and there has to be an adaptation for that too. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this is uh, uh, just two, two uh, rough uh, schematics to show you nickel metal hydride, which is uh, on your upper left and lithium ion on your lower right. Uh, and really the purpose of this slide isn't to get into a lot of the details except to show the differences between the two, uh, the two types of chemistries. When you have on the upper right, uh, on, excuse me, on the uh, upper left, uh, nickel metal hydride, uh, you can see that there's a, uh, there's a negative electrode, positive electrode, negative electrode is also the anode, uh, and, and uh, that's our terminology in the battery industry, the positive electrode is the cathode, and in the middle you have an electrolyte, which is a salt, salt solution. In this case, it's water. So that's a major difference right off the bat. Uh, the nickel metal hydride systems are water-based, but on the lower left, when you see the electrolyte in that system, it is not aqueous, it is a solvent-based uh, electrolyte, which means you have to be more careful in terms of safety and handling of lithium ion batteries, even when they come back at end of life, because they're more energetic and more flammable. Uh, water, of course, uh, doesn't mean that a nickel metal hydride cannot catch on fire, but it's a whole lot less likely. And therefore you're dealing with a different realm when you're handling these batteries, especially as it comes back as a pack at full voltage. Uh, and of course, all of these have the shock uh, and uh, other hazards that are associated with batteries in general. When you take a look at the uh, nickel metal hydride again uh, in the uh, upper left hand side, you'll see that there are some black dots in the negative electrode. And that's schematically showing you the hydrogen that's getting stored there. The reaction is a little bit more complex than that. But the main idea here is that you're shuttling net hydrogen across the, uh, the electrode. And that's why it's called a nickel uh, metal hydride battery. The hydride that refers to that hydrogen that's being stored there. And it gets stored in that uh, metal hydride complex which is a lot of nickel in that complex, by the way. So nickel, nickel rich batteries, uh, you'd think that it would be expensive, but it's actually pretty effective. Why? Uh, with all this nickel in both uh, the anode and cathode, because it's very, very good at handling high rates of power. As Jonathan mentioned, uh, we, we use a relative power level uh, based on the uh, capacity and the current, um, and that's the C rate. So when you break, you might, when you push on that brake, you might be taking in uh, a current in amps that exceeds the value of the, uh, of the capacity of the battery in amp hours by, by a factor of 20. 
or, or even higher, that's a really high ratio. That means a lot of power is coming in and not a lot of place to store it. And that, um, and that is the high C-rate application. Nickel metal hydride is superb at that. Uh, so the hydrogen goes back and forth. And also uh, the cell voltage that you, you can run in the middle of the uh, state of charge. So when you have your cell phone, you usually want to keep it topped off. In this application, it would be like saying, well, sometimes I'm going to need to accept charge really quickly. And sometimes I'm going to have to dump charge really quickly. So I want to be around 50% state of charge. A little bit different than what you think about for a usual battery because it's a power leveling battery in the hybrid electric vehicle application. So when you look at the uh, nickel metal hydride chemistry, it, it, it was a beautiful fit. Toyota was really the, the main mover, uh, first mover and, and really uh, pushed the uh, hybrid electric vehicle uh, platform uh, with Prius and other uh, you know, Lexus related models. Honda came into it as well. Many of the other automakers also picked up on it. And the reason they used it, uh, nickel metal hydride was because it was safe. It came from, uh, it's a derivative of NICAD chemistry, if you remember that. Uh, nickel hydrogen batteries used in space. Nickel metal hydride was the practical thing to use in cars, and it worked incredibly well and uh, was something that improved uh, fuel efficiency. So, as that goes up, you're able, as an automaker, you're able to improve your overall fuel efficiency of your fleet that you sell. And that was the main, the main reason, main motivation for using HEVs in general. And nickel metal hydride ruled the day. Along came lithium ion. Why was lithium ion important? Well, lithium ion was considered a small thing, a small little battery, a little 18650 cell like Jonathan showed. Uh, it's about the size of a double A that goes into laptops and early versions of uh, cell phones and things like that. It wasn't really considered safe enough or economical enough to use in an electric vehicle. But as you fast forward to 2017 and Tesla, uh, they essentially were being watched by the whole world, including the automotive world, in 2017, they got out of something they called production hell, where they just ran into problem after problem after problem and couldn't implement the uh, uh, lithium ion in a safe and economic manner uh, in production like they expected to. But they got out of it and everybody watched and saw, gee, maybe this EV thing can be manufactured. Maybe it's not a science project. Uh, maybe uh, you would feel comfortable uh, putting your hands behind the wheel of uh, Tesla. Model S, and now we've got more models, Model 3, and they're expanding into other things. In that same year, in 2017, that's also the year that VW, uh, which was at the time the largest uh, uh, automaker by uh, market cap, uh, they decided that they were going to take all of that money that came out of that Dieselgate uh, uh, settlement and put it directly into electric vehicle battery development, systems development, and the EV itself developing the EV. And that was a huge uh, transfer of about 6 billion euros in that year. And all of a sudden, EVs became real. And lithium ion became a preferred chemistry because it has a higher energy density than nickel metal hydride. It's not a power leveling battery anymore. It's not something that you run at 50% state of charge. So you can take in charge and you can reduce charge just to make the engine smaller and run more efficiently. Now, no more engine, no more ICE. Now, all you have is a motor and you have to have a compact, lightweight uh, battery to go with it. If you take a look at the lower right with lithium ion, you don't have hydrogen shuttling anymore. You've got lithium ion shuttling back and forth. You've got uh, uh, depiction on the anode, the uh, negative electrode. Uh, you have these graphene planes in the graphite that store the lithium. So you don't actually have lithium metal there, although it's almost as energetic as lithium metal itself. And then on the cathode side, you store it at a um, at a uh, uh, different potential. So you, that's how you set up the cell. And usually most of the cells that go into automotive are based on transition metal oxides. So you'll hear a lot about uh, nickel rich uh, oxides that have uh, a little bit of manganese and cobalt. And that's really what we're talking about. And the reason I mentioned these things in the materials is that they don't fail the same way. Uh, and that's the second point I wanted to make here. With nickel metal hydride, when you're running in the middle with a, with a HUV application in particular, and you uh, go back and forth, the little hydrogen uh, ions do expand and contract the, uh, uh, the, uh, the nickel metal hydride, but they don't blow up the way Jonathan showed you. Jonathan showed you a cell that was abused, but if you stay within in normal operating limits, it's very well behaved. 
the expansion and contraction of the electrodes is very manageable with uh, the hydroxide transport uh, back and forth and, and then that hydrogen uh, transfer. They're all, they're all very manageable uh, expansions. Not so with lithium ion. With lithium ion, uh, you get a lot of expansion. Uh, so several percent it can be in the, in the graphite and similar expansions in, in the metal oxides in the, in the cathode. And as, as the cells age, as you use them and cycle, cycle the battery in the car, its uh, life decreases and everybody notices that. The difference is that you can regenerate a nickel metal hydride battery because those separations that occur are mild separations, they're not catastrophic. And you can, and you can run them using equipment that uh, A3 Global has with Nuvant uh, type models that will cycle a nickel metal hydride battery and rejuvenate it. Whereas with lithium ion, you actually can have processes that have side reactions and you lose capacity to those side reactions. And you also get little extra layers of resistance that, like Jonathan was talking about, it makes it harder for uh, charges and discharges to happen uh, and uh, at the same voltages and you end up wasting uh, some of the power. It goes off as heat. And the, uh, the thing about heat is that it's going to raise the temperature and accelerate the aging. Temperature is always the enemy of, of batteries, uh, and especially so with lithium ion. So you don't have the reversible processes that you, in, um, in lithium ion to rejuvenate it the way you do with nickel metal hydride. But uh, you know the, the reason that, that you're using two different types of chemistries and, and, uh, uh, and you have all these different lithium ion variations is that everybody wants to get now, high energy density, they still want to get uh, to full charge if possible. This is a case where you don't want to operate at 50% if you don't have an ICE to, to give you range. You're relying entirely on the battery, so you're going to top it off. You're going to take it down, and this is the most stressful way to operate any battery. Yeah, there are lots of improvements on that. Uh, there are tons of ways where you can see today that the people have already made improvements just in the last few years with the EV boom. The EV boom from 2017 to, to now, five years, uh, a lot has happened in a very short amount of time to improve it. But nevertheless, you cannot regenerate, you cannot rejuvenate uh, a lithium ion battery the way you can, a nickel metal hydride battery. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so what are, what, are, what are we talking about here? The types of batteries that, that we have are shown in these different forms. If you look in the upper right, you'll see a, a skateboard platform, the four wheels, uh, and the battery uh, is in between the axles and uh, be and between the, um, uh, the frames, <coughs> excuse me, of the, uh, of the skateboard. And so that sets out your XY dimension, your footprint, and then you make it as tall, you know, as in height as, uh, as practical. Uh, what you see in, in the upper right is the uh, Ultium platform, which is being developed by General Motors in conjunction with LG Energy Solution, LG Chemical. Um, they have a joint venture in four plants to produce the batteries, and uh, they are located not too far away from where those uh, cells that are being made uh, in those four plants will be, <coughs> excuse me, assembled into platforms like this. And everybody wants to take cells and put them directly into the chassis. That's the other technique. The automotive is pushing. They want to lower cost everywhere. That's part of what's happening. Why is that important? Because uh, they may not necessarily be thinking about remanufacturing. They're probably putting them together and gluing things, putting in potting materials and epoxies that are hard to separate. So actually taking care of a battery uh, at the end of this first service life uh, might become more challenging as we go down the road. There wasn't as much of an expectation that this would be part of the full life cycle of an EV battery model when they were first designed. But kind of interesting, I think. If you take a look at the uh, upper left, uh, that is uh, a shelf full of uh, prismatic batteries made with lithium iron phosphate. Uh, that's a different chemistry than what I was talking about before, a different chemistry than the one that uh, Ultium is going to be using, that joint venture between GM and LG Energy Solution. Uh, the LFP one that, that's shown there is the BYD blade. It's one of the more optimized lithium iron phosphate batteries. and it also happens to be more modular. It has uh, more of a look of the kind of module that you see with the nickel metal hydride module, but it's a single cell, just one big one packed up into uh, a sealed uh, stainless steel uh, laser, laser welded uh, 
uh, enclosure. Uh, so there's probably more possibilities to use LFP in this form, uh, not just because it's coming in, in these discrete units that can be taken apart, but also because lithium iron phosphate is a nice uh, battery to have when you're building huge things that are too big for vehicles and really for grid energy storage on a large scale. So repurposing these things might be very interesting at some point in the future. Uh, you can see some of these things at the pack level uh, below those pictures that I just pointed out. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, what, you're, what you're looking at is growth all over the world, including China, which is the leader in uh, producing cells today. We measure these things in gigawatt hours. So a watt hour, the unit of energy, as uh, Jonathan pointed out, well, multiply that by 1 billion, and that's, uh, that's a trading unit when you talk about how many cells you're making in a plant. Uh, that's a lot of watt hours. And uh, that's uh, yeah, one watt hour, um, one gigawatt hour per year. Uh, that's about 16,667, you know, if we want to be exact, uh, uh, Model S batteries, for example, if they're uh, going to be 60 kilowatt hour batteries. So just to give you a feel for what that translates to. But the information you see in front of you was put together uh, a few months ago and it's already out of date. Uh, there's, there, there are new announcements for new plants cropping up all the time, especially after the IRA uh, legislation came about. Um, a lot of companies that were uh, thinking, well, we can just import uh, batteries and EVs into the US uh, decided that you know maybe there's more of an incentive to build plants in the US. Toyota, Honda uh, responded um, since the IRA announcement, and you probably see many, many more as the um, as the uh, full force of the legislation and its benefits come into effect uh, in January of 23, 2023. So you can see that the pie is quite busy already and growing. And if uh, anybody had thought that this would be a reality even a couple of years ago. Uh, well, you'd be in a, in, a, in a huge minority. Bloomberg, uh, New Energy Finance, um, the IEA, uh, International Energy Association, and other notable organizations that analyze this market and do forecasts did not see this coming. Uh, this is uh, an incredible uh, growth rate for lithium ion batteries. And uh, it looks like it's not only going to be for the, the EVs and the batteries, but also the supply chain of all the critical materials that are needed. Uh, so this is just a, a very, uh, very pervasive um, uh, market and industry uh, that's evolving in North America. Uh, it has been in Europe, and there's plenty of incentives uh, to, uh, to look at uh, what else we can do with these things. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so the, the question is now, where are these plants? Uh, you know, who, who's doing what? And again, this is already outdated there. You know, I mean, we'd have to put in another 10% um, gigawatt hours just, just for the last few months on this already uh, rapidly growing uh, industry. If you go on to the next slide, please. Yeah, what does that mean for end of life batteries? So, you know, if you have a battery and it's gonna last 10 years and uh, they're already warranting the EV, including the EV battery for eight years. So if you go to 10 years, well, you got to wait a decade for that uh, for that battery to go into remanufacturing, right? Yes, you do. Um, so what I what I'm showing you here, and you can see kind of this S-shaped curve. It's just actually a sigmoidal curve. <clears throat> it's a it's a function that I use um, where I take the data from forecasts from uh, analysts, and I uh, and then I compile it and fit it to this curve. Um, growth looks exponential if you look at the inset in the upper right you see a graph with a, sigmoidal, with a sigmoidal curve and an inset that makes it looks like, look like it's uh, exponential. But that's just because we're magnifying the part of the curve that we're in today, presently in these years. As you go out, these markets are gonna get saturated and only a limited number of passenger cars are gonna be made and it's gonna level out. So that's kind of the working curve. What would happen if we took this working curve and shifted it uh, 10 years? So the blue line on the upper right um, shows, uh, shows where we are now. And the 10 year pipeline would be the green line that's below it. So simply, simply taking the number of batteries produced in a year, either real data or the forecast, which is what that blue line represents, uh, kind of a merge of that and shift it over by 10 years. And you take a look and you say, wow, it's gonna be a while 
before a significant amount of batteries come back into the pipeline. So what's lost in the details here is how big this industry can be, even when it's a few percent. So as nickel metal hydride continues kind of its heyday, because it is um, you know, at the point where uh, the 10 year pipeline has significant volume. And as you look at the lithium ion, it's gonna pick up and take over. So as we show uh, on this graph over here, it looks like you know, 2030, the things are gonna become very significant. But even before that, the industry has to get ready and everybody who's participating in it is gonna be at the ground floor at, at uh, converting lithium ion batteries or taking lithium ion batteries from end of life and uh, basically evaluating them. Remember, it's not that easy to recondition them uh, if at all possible, but we can take them and we can evaluate them very quickly uh, pull out the good cells and, and do something else with the cells that are not as good and optimize the value of the stream, uh, that is the proposition that we're talking about. So uh, that is something that A3 Global is preparing to do. And I think uh, really just not too early to get ready for that future. Uh, it is coming and there are going to be significant opportunities to work with lithium ion. As I said, the use cases extend well beyond automotive. If you go on to the next slide, please. Uh, oh, and one more, please. Um, so um, some of the things that are changing aren't all batteries. Uh, and in terms of the cell itself, uh, you have electronics on board. For nickel metal hydride, the electronics are, uh, you know, they're, they're fundamental. And for lithium ion, uh, they're a little bit more complex. They do more measurements. And because it's a more, uh, a system that came on later, there are more options on simplification in terms of communications. You don't have to have a lot of wiring. Today, when you look at a battery, uh, any battery at all, nickel metal hydride or lithium ion, you'll see a lot of wiring harnesses, which we lovingly call spaghetti, you know, things that are all over the place or they're wrapped up into uh, bundles. But anyway, you look at it, uh, the, uh, uh, those, those are things which are single point failures in many cases, if you break a wire, and it's a two wire communication. Uh, so you can substitute a lot of these things at a very um, uh, reasonable cost using some of the new uh, wireless systems. And that's exactly what's going into some of the newer uh, battery plants and EV plants uh, that are coming up, uh, like the Ultium plants, for example. They're using wireless battery for the communications. So you no longer have to worry about uh, uh, assembling things and wiring things and making sure you leave space for the wiring harnesses and having those points of failure. Instead, you have uh, something which we've come to rely on. And most of this, <coughs> oh, excuse me, uh, most of this uh, wireless communication, you can use any form you want. Some of it is Bluetooth, Zigbee, uh, but uh, you know, some of the other things that people are doing are really more like Wi-Fi. So uh, all of these innovations will also impact and simplify the ability to remanufacture batteries and to reuse the electronics. Uh, there'll be more flexibility from that point of view as well. Go on to the next slide, please. So uh, there are a lot of trends we can talk about and I welcome you to, to, uh, to bring up any questions that you have in the industry. Things are changing very quickly in, in automotive. Uh, the lithium ion battery technology is seeping into other battery applications for the grid, for, uh, for uh, non-automotive uh, but motive applications like forklifts, uh, materials, uh, handling equipment, floor sweepers, all sorts of things. Um, and it's really becoming more favorable and economical in those other markets because automakers are investing in cost reduction and economies of scale are improving uh, the acquisition of raw materials and production of cells and assembly into batteries. So it's a really uh, exciting world in batteries today. Uh, nickel metal hydride is presently uh, the, you know, a wonderful thing to, uh, to do for uh, remanufacturing because you can rejuvenate it uh, and the chemistry is very robust. At some point, if we don't use nickel metal hydride batteries anymore, well, the nickel value in there is tremendous. We can take it to metals value. There's a long way to go for that. Lithium ion, well, we're on, we're hoping, uh, everybody's hoping that the, uh, the batteries that are built today are built with some forethought and, and uh, consideration for uh, total life cycles so that they can be uh, taken apart uh, relatively easy, easily and reassembled for uh, reuse. Uh, 
So that's what I wanted to talk about. I hope uh, I've addressed your questions. Uh, if something comes up afterwards and you want to contact me through A3 Global, uh, please, I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. That was uh, very interesting and uh, very informative and helpful in, in understanding, um, you know, where lithium ion batteries are going and, and electric vehicles, the whole market in general. Um, and this is Ron's information. So we'll, we're at the point where we'll take any um, questions also. Um, Aaron, do you have anything you wanted to add before we kind of jump into questions? And No, I just wanted to say thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, Ron. Appreciate it. Very informative. I'm going to put our email address over here in the uh, chat um, chat group info at a3global.com if you have any questions about what you've seen today. So we're going to go ahead and um, uh, stop the recording. And then if there's any questions, you can um, feel free to ask them, either type them in the chat box or just unmute yourself.